Okay, well, I'm delighted to be here today and to have a chance to talk about this paper um, with you all. Um, and really grateful to the SEB for allowing both Caitlin and myself to talk about this. So this is work and questions that we started thinking about from our respective areas when we were postdocs together at the University of Illinois. I'm now at the University of Essex in the UK, and Caitlin is now a research fellow at the University of Western Australia. And so firstly, um, because I'm bringing this talk to you today from the University of Western Australia, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to have an acknowledgement of country. And so the University of Western Australia acknowledges that its campus is situated on the Noongar land and that the Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their language, values and beliefs uh, and knowledge. Thank you. For that, Caitlin. Uh, and so now we'll get into an extension of sharing um our work with you so today we'll just walk through this outline of what we're going to talk to you about we'll start with a bit of a discussion about crops and climate change um so really setting the scene for why we both believe this is one of the most important topics we can be talking about um and particularly why we're focused on temperature uh we'll then start through an understanding of the various scales that we've discussed in our paper and so one of the best things about um working together as we did is that we were able to bring on collaborators with various research interests to really hone in on the way that temperature um, impacts these various scales. And so I'll start with the enzyme scale, build some complexity as we move to the leaf scale, uh, and then Caitlin will take over the very complex interactions that happen at both the plant and ecosystem scale. Um, and so why why are we here talking about this with you? Well, I think um, this will come as a surprise to very few of you uh, that we find ourselves in the unfortunate position of knowing that carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere at an absolutely accelerating rate. We are here. I like to put this little arrow on here to show that we are currently tracking what was once referred to as a worst case scenario and is now absolutely business as usual. And despite a slight dip in global carbon emissions last year when we all stayed home, didn't travel, lived a very sustainable lifestyle for the most part, we are still tracking the business as usual scenario. So this is a systemic problem that individual choices are likely not going to solve. And that means we have to start considering what type of uh, mitigation effects we have on the globe and for things like agriculture. And this is a huge problem when we talk about plant biology because of course, this increase in CO2 is driving increased global surface temperatures. I really like this show your stripes because I think it gives us a really visual representation of what we're facing here. If you were born after 1990, you've never experienced a normal temperature year. You have lived your entire life in the red. And we can see that our past 20 years have been consistently darker, deeper shades of red, which means that our mean annual temperature has increased drastically from our pre-industrial average and from the global average uh, before the industrial revolution. And this is having huge impacts already on agricultural predict production. We often think about climate change as being a problem for the future, but we are living with the effects of this at the moment. And we see um, via this really lovely review paper that just came out in April, um, sorry, not a review paper, via this modeling paper that came out in April that we can actually model the changes on total factor productivity or so agricultural productivity around the world. And what we see is a decline in agricultural productivity growth around the world as mean growing temperature or green season temperature increases. And globally, this slowdown is about 21% since 1961. And that's equivalent to about the last seven years of productivity increases. So we're seeing this effect and we're seeing this effect troublingly more in certain regions of the globe. Specifically, we see these reductions in um, Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in the global South predominantly. And so this is not an equal um, impact of, for us all around the globe. And that's going to have huge inequality ramifications as we go forward. So we see that the reduction is more severe. So like 26 to 34% in warmer regions like Latin America, the Caribbean, um, and throughout most of the equatorial regions. And so from this, I will pass it over to Caitlin, who will give us a bit more understanding of that. 
And so, thanks, thanks Amanda. And so uh, these two figures here, I thought just really nicely highlighted. Um, the one on the left is from the US Geological Survey, um, just plotting up where in the world uh, our major cropping regions are. And so they're indicated here in this sort of fluorescent, bright fluoro green color. Um, and you can see that, you know, we've got hotspots in the Midwest US, right through Europe, um, lots of parts through Asia, uh, little hotspots in Australia. So we've got the eastern states and then the southwest um, of the country of Australia down in the south here, and then parts of um, South America as well and Africa. And if we have a look over at the figure on the right, um, this figure is the classic um, temperature change, land surface temperature change figure taken from the IPCC's um, Assessment 5 report. And it basically shows us uh, the observed changes that have occurred in land surface temperature from the when measurements sort of began by and large across the globe in 1901 through to 2012. And what we can see, if you kind of loosely look between the two figures, is that hotspot regions of agricultural productivity, so the Midwest, South America, through these parts of Europe, even to a lesser extent, Asia, Australia, and through Africa, where there's actually temperature data available, are all getting hotter. So we've experienced hotter in increase in um, land surface temperature. And while it wasn't really a major theme of our uh, review paper, I still find it's very important to talk about uh, changing rainfall regimes in the context of crop photosynthesis and productivity, because temperature and rainfall are two of the most important uh, variables for crop, more climate variables for crop, determining crop productivity. And this figure from the, also from the IPCC fifth assessment report shows the changes in the observed changes in annual rainfall over land uh, for the same sort of time period as the temperature figure, but also for the more recent 60 year time period as well. And it sort of is highlighted more clearly in the recent 60 year time period where you've got regions of the uh, world, Midwest, uh, South America, and through Northern parts of Europe and tropical Northern Australia, which are forecast to receive more rainfall uh, annually, whereas parts of the world like Africa, for example, the Mediterranean, parts of sort of Northern Asia and the major crop growing regions of Australia are forecast to receive much less rainfall uh, as we, uh, sorry, have experienced much less rainfall uh, in recent years. Uh, and this is only predicted to get worse um, as we move forward. And this figure here uh, shows what that uh, what those regional changes are likely to do to the projected uh, yields from our global crop resources. And so we have a look at the period from 2010 to 2029 here, so the, the current 20 year period that we're in. We can see that some regions uh, in blue uh, show a, an increased projection in yield forecast, whereas others around the globe are forecast to see a decrease in yield over this time period. And the, the warmth or the, the intensity of the color um, gives an indication of how much uh, of a proportion of that percentage increase is likely to be. And I guess the key take home measure uh, message from this figure is that right now we're at about a 50-50 split where some areas of the world are expected to see a much higher uh, increase in um, yield whereas others are expected to see a decrease. And as we move forward into future 20-year uh, period blocks into the future, right up to the um, period of 2109, we're seeing that increasingly um, the models are suggesting that we're going to see greater decrease in yields for our crop regions as opposed to increasing yields from the benefits of, say, higher rainfall in some parts of the world. And so this really led... Uh, us to start thinking about this concept and how we can uh, begin to understand the effect of increasing temperature on crop photosynthesis from not only the enzyme scale, which Amanda will talk to you about in a second, but right through to the leaf, the plant and the ecosystem scale. And what are some of the factors that are occurring at each of these levels um, that are affecting crop photosynthesis? And what are some of the solutions um, that are currently being implemented and that could be implemented um, moving forward. And so I'll hand over to Amanda to talk to us about the enzyme scale advances that we're looking at. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. I really like this slide, especially because it really shows the sort of integrated nature of the work. And so I'll start with enzymes and that has such an immediate response time into the leaf, into the plant, into the ecosystem. But you can see, I particularly appreciate this growth from 
immediate to cumulative responses. And we've designed the talk that way as well. And so, of course, um, for those of you who uh, are familiar with the type of work I do or me as a speaker, you will be no surprise that I'm talking about Rubisco. So at the enzyme scale, carbon fixation really depends on Rubisco. This um, enzyme is got arguably the most important job on the planet. Um, and it's because its entire you know, raison d'etre is to fix a CO2 to RUBP in that first committed step of the Calvin cycle. And so Rubisco has fixed every carbon in carbon-based organisms on this planet. All plants have Rubisco. Um, many photosynthetic microbes have Rubisco. Uh, algae have Rubisco. So Rubisco is the carbon fixer um, that our life on Earth depends on. Uh, and so like many enzymes, Rubisco has this um, peaked temperature response. So as temperature increases, we get more and more and more reactions. Um, and because photosynthesis is so dependent on these carbon reactions that are enzyme based, we see the same response coming in leaf level photosynthesis. So like many enzyme processes, we have um, a general increase here in this green line of photosynthesis up to a thermal optimum, after which reaction rates slowly start to fall off. And we can contrast that with something like respiration, which is not so enzyme mediated. And we see that this um, biochemical react or this reaction increases with temperature really rapidly. And some of the reasons that this falls off so quickly in photosynthesis are directly due to Rubisco. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. There are, of course, other enzymes responsible for photosynthetic carbon fixation. Um, you know, just because I think Rubisco is the most important one, I'm not dissing any of the others. And we talk about some of them in the paper. Um, but for the interest of time today, we'll really focus on this one. And that's because, of course, Rubisco has the most important job, but it also has another job. So Rubisco is a dual function enzyme. So in addition to fixing a carbon dioxide or attaching a carbon dioxide to RUBP, during the carboxylation reactions of the Calvin cycle, Rubisco can also fix an oxygen. And it does this about 25% of the time in the current atmosphere. So oxygen and CO2 molecularly are very similar. Oxygen can readily fit into that active site pocket of Rubisco. Um, and when it fixes an oxygen, it produces not 2PGA, like our carboxylation reactions produce, but it instead produces a compound that the chloroplast cannot use. So we call it 2PG, phosphoglycolate, um, which then has to be recycled to get this carbon back into the carbon fixation reactions um, through a process called photorespiration. And so what does this have to do with Rubisco temperature responses, you might be asking? Um, well, it's a problem because this oxygenation reaction that happens 25% of the time in our current atmosphere increases with temperature um, so that uh, Rubisco is, in fact, a poorer carbon, carbon fixing enzyme at higher temperatures. So, and increase, right? We put more energy in, we get faster responses out. So just like um, most, most things that we think of. So the harder we work or the more energy available to do the work, the more work that gets done. And we see this if we look at just Rubisco turnover rate in general. So we get increasing reaction rates for both the carbon and the oxygen fixing reaction rates as temperature increases. Um, and that's plotted here in green. But the problem is that the increase in Rubisco oxygen rates um, sort of wins as temperatures increase. And so we see a decline in the relative specificity for CO2. And so I've tried to outline that here, but what we can see is that that means that at warmer temperatures, we get this increased propensity towards what's known as photorespiration. And this is a huge issue because this is a really big yield drag on plants, right? So currently, just in our current atmospheres, if we model this across the Midwest, we know that this costs about 30% in yield potential. Um, as temperatures increase, we know that CO2 will be increasing, but those numbers stay relatively constant. And so that's a huge loss of productivity for crops. And no surprise, a lot of the enzyme-related bioengineering targets to improve temperature come from trying to improve Rubisco and its performance at elevated temperatures. Um, and so we've outlined a few of them in the paper. 
And I'll just highlight them here. The first are, of course, manipulating rubisco performance through direct manipulation of those kinetics. Um, there are a lot of really exciting groups looking at, can we change, actually change Rubisco's fundamental kinetic trade-offs? And can we make a faster or a more specific version of the enzyme? There's also, of course, great work done looking at enhancing the thermostability of Rubisco chaperone protein. So I didn't get into that that much here, um, but some of you will be very familiar with this work. Um, and if you're not, I urge you to please, please give our paper a read. Um, but also to redesign photorespiration. So there are a few strategies out there to see if we can, instead of manipulating Rubisco directly, can we lower the cost of that resulting photorespiration reaction? Um, and so there are some strategies to put synthetic pathways with lower energy requirements into plants to engineer C2 photosynthesis, which is an evolutionary stopping point between, or an evolutionary transition point between C3s and C4 evolution. Um, or, of course, introducing C4 photosynthesis. So C4 rice is, is making amazing gains in that. Um, and again, we've signposted some really exciting uh, papers for you guys to read if you follow through to this link. Um, of course, just because I love enzymes doesn't mean that that's where everything stops. And so as we scale responses from the enzyme to the leaf, we're, of course, building complexity. So a leaf is not just one large pool of enzymes. Um, and one of the main sources of this added complexity is following the carbon dioxide diffusion into the leaf. Uh, and that's been portrayed really well in this lovely graphic by Tori Clark, who's a postdoc at ANU um, and has just published this wonderful paper. Um, and this really outlines the different resistances that this molecule of carbon dioxide is going to find before it gets to the site of carboxylation to Rubisco, right? Um, and these diffusive pathways, this mesophyll conductance, as it's referred to, uh, has some really interesting temperature responses, and they've been reviewed really well. But in our paper, we focused here at the entrance of CO2 into the leaf. And that entrance is, of course, stomata. And so um, we worked with Tracy Lawson, who's a co-author on this paper, um, to really dive into some of the uh, <coughs> temperature responses of stomatal function. Um, Stomata control the majority of gas exchange into or between the atmosphere and the leaf, um, but it comes at a, a cost. So by opening stomata to allow CO2 to diffuse into the leaf, plants run the risk of losing water um, and into the atmosphere. And so this trade-off between um, carbon and water status for the plant really dictates the responses of stomata to temperature. So stomata open and close in response to various signals. So light intensity, internal CO2, external CO2 concentration, temperature, but also vapor pressure deficit. So the water status of the plant is really important in determining whether or not they'll take this risk for CO2 at, at the cost of water. Um, and so because of this, generalizing stomatal responses to changes in temperature is a little more difficult than generalizing something like enzyme level responses. So we have see specific differences here um, between stomatal uh, conductance in response to increasing ambient leaf temperature uh, here. But we also see what winds up being a double belled response so that stomatal um, so might have, again, an optimum temperature that they will remain open to allow gas exchange. At temperatures above this optimal temperature, we get a sharp decline as stomata will close to um, prevent water loss. But if plants are exposed to um, sustained growth at elevated temperature, we get this increase again to allow more carbon fixation to happen. And so Manipulating this response, both within the species-specific responsiveness of it and the behavior of stomata, um, are again another really exciting target um, to modify plant responses to changes in growth temperature at crops. Um, and I will pass this back over to Caitlin to uh, walk you through some of these links, not only between scaling again into the leaf, but now scaling that leaf to the whole plant, which, as I mentioned earlier, builds another layer of complexity onto it. Thank you, Amanda. And so once we get to the plant scale, um, this, fig this uh, slide here, I'm going to step through some of the traits that we identified within our paper. 
that are sort of at the forefront of looking to improve resilience to uh, heat stress in crop varieties. And so here uh, in this figure, we've got a heat susceptible plant that's looking a little bit sad and wilty over here on the left, and then a heat tolerant plant and a number of different um, traits, I guess, that could be improved or enhanced to allow uh, a plant to be more tolerant. And so the first one is really looking at um, higher grain enzyme, higher enzyme activity within the grains. And so that particularly relates to like invertase activity and increasing the that allows uh, increasing carbohydrate transport from photosynthetic um, machinery up into the grain. Um, sorry, I'm just finding my little slide clicker here. Uh, number two, so over here, we're looking at um, accelerating, or not we, but uh, scientists are looking at moving uh, sugars from the stems to the grain, so accelerating that uh, process to make it a lot faster, so that basically you're getting the, the photosynthate um, product from you know, the area of photosynthesis in the cells up into the grain faster. Um, then, I'm sorry, I'm seeing a white screen. Then number three, we're looking at basically making leaves more erect to avoid one, scorching damage from sun that's hitting the solar canopy at the top, um, but also more erect leaves um, are looking at ways as well to make sucrose transporter expression uh, much higher in these leaves, which helps to maintain flow and loading, as well as carbon allocation and getting carbon from those um, photosynthetic uh, cells up into non-photosynthetic um, parts of the plant, such as the grain. Um, by having more erect leaves as well, you're also allowing for better penetration of light through the canopy. And so you're starting to get light at lower layers of the plant canopy. Um, it also helps to keep the light, all leaves within the plant canopy, closer to the temperature optimum, um, as well as um, increasing the wax content of some of these leaves also helps with reducing water uh, loss through the leaves and through the stomata. And so getting some of these traits into the plant is uh, quite useful at the leaf level. Um, number five down the bottom of the plant here is looking at increasing the amount of tillers down the bottom of the plant, because if you've got increased light coming through the canopy, then you have more light available to um, maintain leaves lower in the canopy. And then this all helps with um, delaying senescence of the plant and also gives you more surface area, I guess, for photosynthesis to be occurring. Um, if we then progress down to number six, um, which is down at the root zone, um, plants with deeper roots get, a, get greater access to more water, but also a greater portion of nutrients and also adds a lot in terms of carbon to the soil um, and organic material and creates a really healthy soil um, microclimate and microbiome. And so um, promoting plants with deeper roots um, has these kind of flow on effects um, for agricultural ecosystem health and sustainability. Um, if we look at number seven, back down here into the, the leaf again, um, looks at kind of getting more chlorophyll in what is called a sweet spot. And so this is basically having not all the chlorophyll kind of bunched in the top of canopy leaves, um, but also sort of, you know, more evenly throughout the canopy as well. Uh, also helps to improve with um, keeping more leaves at operating at their thermal optimum um, throughout the plant. And then number eight, as Amanda also mentioned before, is looking at um, stomata and increasing not only their size, but their stomatal density. Um, to allow greater CO2 entry within the leaf. Um, also, to um, there's also studies that are looking at modifying stomatal density um, through the canopy as well. So not having, you know, a high amount of stomata at the top of the canopy where you do have high solar load, and so that's creating a much higher evaporative demand, particularly if you've got a hot and dry atmosphere. And so decreasing stomatal density at the top of the canopy, but promoting stomatal density at the bottom of the canopy where there's more CO2 usually available, um, particularly from soil respiration processes uh, where the soil's re-emitting um, carbon dioxide through microbial carbon breakdown. So essentially, if you've got more stomata down in these lower, um, these lower leaves down at the bottom of the plant, then um, you've got a greater chance of more photosynthesis occurring. And so these are all detailed in a lot more detail, a lot more eloquently within our paper. Um, but it's just, I guess, some of the techniques that can be used to improve um, plant scale traits. And so then I guess um, this slide here is basically a, an overview, sort of a 
you know, in-field example of some of the techniques that we have on, on, on hand to be able to measure plant heat stress a lot faster in the field. And so you can see there's a lot of activity going on in this field. Um, it's actually a, a team that I used to work with when I was at the University of Illinois. And you have a group of people over here on the left-hand side looking at collecting leaf hyperspectral measurements. And I think it's also a bit hard to see, but there is some leaf gas exchange going on here as well, um, which I failed to highlight earlier on. And from these leaf level hyperspectral measurements, we can then scale this up and look at canopy scale hyperspectral measurements using manual pushed through field gantries, such as this um, field roving evaluation device. We also um, have the ability to, you know, basically form closed portable chamber systems to look at canopy scale photosynthesis. So scaling up from what's going on over here at the individual leaf to looking at how photosynthesis is varying, varying through the canopy, um, through the individual plant canopy, starting to tease apart differences between top of canopy and below and lower canopy leaves. And then tying this back into heat stress, um, looking at testing new tools. So um, some of you may have heard of uh, the passive measurement of sun-induced chlorophyll fluorescence using um, high resolution hyperspectral sensors. And so this little um, field system as well is basically, basically has a spectrometer measuring on it. So we're capturing the through passive activation of chlorophyll fluorescence that is being emitted by the plant canopy and then relating that to um, changes in photosynthesis um, across either different cultivars or um, different heat treatments um, as well. And so <clears throat> then this is going to be a nice sort of transition into how do we then go from a leaf to an ecosystem? And essentially, Amanda and I have had many conversations about this over our years working together. But essentially, by the time you get to the ecosystem scale, the effects that we've talked about in terms of enzyme activity, leaf scale processes, things that um, stomatal um, systems, plant transport systems, and well as well as individual plants, all start to compound as you get up to the ecosystem scale. And so here we've got our lovely little diagram of uh, Tori Clark's lovely little diagram of the CO2 journey within a leaf. And so, this is just a very simple schematic to kind of demonstrate my point. Um, but essentially, I then think of a plant as like lots of kind of a factory with lots of little um, CO2 journeys going on within the individual plant itself. And then some of the things like light penetration through the canopy, changes in rooting structure and canopy architecture, um, new recently emerged leaves versus older, lower in the canopy leaves that are all operating at different photosynthetic efficiencies. To then getting up to, I guess, the larger ecosystem scale where you've got many plants operating together within the system, you've got neighbouring effects, you've got changes in sunlight penetration through the canopy still, but with that extra layer of complexity because of the neighbouring effects. Uh, you've also got competition for resources. So these plants are competing for sunlight, for water, for nutrients, um, and a bunch of different things, as well as even the effect of pests, okay? And so I guess, you know, um, my family and friends at the moment have all gone into a lockdown in Melbourne because we're trying to keep on top of a recent COVID outbreak. And so if you get a same kind of thing with plants, you get pest outbreak and it's harder to isolate if you're in a big community of plants together. Um, some other things as well. Um, in this particular e instance, when we're thinking of ecosystem scale processes, we're suddenly thinking about how the climate is interacting with these systems. So things like sunlight and temperature changes over time. And in particular for ecosystem scale processes with in relation to an increasing temperature is the coupled effect of the atmosphere basically having a higher vapor pressure deficit capacity. And so with a hotter atmosphere, the atm sorry, with the hotter temperatures, the atmosphere can essentially hold more water. So it has a higher capacity for, for drawing water which basically increases the vapour pressure deficit um, that an atmosphere can reach, which places more, I guess, stress and pressure on plant systems and the stomata in particular um, to draw water resources, a stronger gradient, I guess, between the, the, land, uh, the land surface and the plant surface and the atmosphere. And so what that greater pool of water uh, is likely to do in the future is also an element that we discuss in the paper. And so, we have, um, we also identified and discussed a number of different ways to measure these processes at the ecosystem scale. 
And so um, my favorite of all of these techniques is the eddy covariance flux tower. And it's the area that I've received sort of most of my training um, in. And so these flux towers are basically a fixed um, position in the field. They are uh, for all the leaf physiologists out there an N of one, but they also measure a lot of leaves over a large space. And so rather than clamping on a leaf and getting really fine tuned and very controlled um, measurements of what's going on with photosynthesis at a point in time, we're then measuring with these uh, instruments at really high capacity um, and inferring photosynthesis over longer sort of time scales, which has really helped um, the leaf level of measurements are really helping us to inform what we're actually seeing at this larger scale. Um, this tower in the background also is a meteorological station, so it's measuring things like air temperature and vapor pressure deficit, um, humidity, all those sorts of um, parameters to then couple changes in ecosystem carbon flux with what's going on with the climate. Equally, uh, face experiments are really useful as well. Um, the free air CO2 enrichment studies, which are, this one here is at the Soy Face Research Facility in uh, Illinois. And then with new technologies such as drones and uh, phenotyping systems, which um, groups like Bob Furbank's group at ANU are really leading the way in a lot of field phenotyping at sort of this large ecosystem scale to then link um, measurements of ecosystem productivity and stress uh, over time. Um, and so this is just here an example of how measuring and the importance of measuring long-term fluxes. So this is from um, one of the flux towers like I just showed you. And this is showing us um, during the growing season um, period mainly, but this figure here on the right shows us our gross primary productivity, which is basically ecosystem photosynthesis um, at scale over a number of different growing seasons. So you've got 2011 and 2012, 14 and 15, 17 and 18, which were corn growing years in the Midwest US. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to the yellow curve uh, in this figure because it's much lower and um, drops away a lot quicker than the other curves. And this is mainly because it was a much hotter period um, during the Midwest um, growing season and it was also a really dry season. So they didn't really receive rain at all during like the the peak um, or the, the most important part of the growing season, which for them is about June, July. And so very little rainfall. So the crops didn't really get a very good start. And we saw that reflected in our yields. So even though these systems in the Midwest are in an area where rainfall is projected to increase, um, they can still experience these hot and really dry conditions comparatively. I mean, people in Australia would laugh at the dryness of this particular situation. Um, but for the maize um, corn yields, it saw a very significant decrease um, in yields. And so how we manage that into the future and how we understand um, the complexities of this climate and ecosystem productivity and ecosystem photosynthesis dynamic uh, is really facilitated by these long term um, measurements that we can make with um, things like eddy covariance flux towers, hence why I like them so much. And so um, with this, I want to bring, I guess, all of this back together uh, and basically state that measurements and understanding photosynthesis and the effects of temperature and rising temperature on crop photosynthesis does require measurements across a multitude of different scales. And so by understanding you know, CO2 response curves and photosynthesis at the leaf scale and linking this with some new hyperspectral um, techniques in the field helps us then scale up to look at canopy scale changes over courses of during the day, for example, we can then create with um, some of these new hyperspectral cameras, reflectance image cubes, which, which can relate surface, um, canopy surface temperature and other um, properties to photosynthetic capacity and performance. Um, likewise, the flux towers allow us to then monitor this change over periods of time and space. And then these, these data are really useful for then upscaling to um, regional and global scale um, models and uh, monitoring of um, crop photosynthesis and productivity um, right across the globe. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to Amanda um, for the final slide for our talk. Right, and I guess with our final um, thought, we just wanna leave you with the reminder of why, why we think understanding the temperature responses of photosynthesis and talking to our colleagues is so important. And it's because protecting crop photosynthesis from rising temperature is likely to help us meet our future food and fuel demands. And so what we're looking at right now is redrawn 
from that classic Ray et al. 2013 paper in PLOS One that is pointing out the fact that to meet the projected food demands, the stashed line of 2050, crop production has to increase from its current pace, which is here in this solid line. And so this is highlighted for rice and wheat, two of our important crops um, for calories across the world, but the same trend is present in almost all of our major food crops. So we are not making the year on year yield gains to match the food demand that's projected for 2050. And this is not even taking into account the drastic changes in climates that we're anticipating within that time. And so as many of you are aware, we believe that photosynthesis is one of our um, most promising targets to boost this food yield or this crop yield. Um, but that means that we have to consider responses and strategies now that are going to be effective for a 2050 climate. And that involves strategies that are going to be able to be more resilient when grown at elevated temperature and in a different carbon um, enriched world, because that doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. Uh, and so with that maybe heavy reminder on our shoulders of why we're doing this work, um, we'd just like to offer our sincere thank you to the SEB for inviting us to give this talk. Uh, and allowing us to do it together. It's been really nice working together on this. And I think I can speak for Caitlin and myself when I say neither of us would have been entirely comfortable speaking to the other's scale. So thank you very much um, for allowing it. And a huge thank you to the co-authors that worked on this paper with us to bring together their different areas of expertise. So um, mentioning them by name, is Dr. Catherine Meacham Henswold, who is a postdoc at the University of Illinois, Pauline Lemonnier, Dr. Pauline Lemonnier, who is a postdoc now with Tracy Lawson at the University of Essex, um, who really brought this model component on for us. Uh, Dr. Becky Slatery, um, who again was a postdoc at Illinois with us. Um, Claire Benjamin, who was responsible for helping us make sure our figures stayed to theme. Uh, and Carl Bernacki, who's been doing work in this photosynthesis and temperature space for a really long time. Uh, we were supported by various grants. Um, and of course, across three institutions. And so with that, I think we're coming to the end, um, taking you back to some photos of our very first collaboration uh, on a really wonderful <laughs> Halloween costume, um, straight to the field where we looked distinctly less glamorous. Uh, we are happy to take some questions um, and I hope we have some from early career people in the audience, but thank you very much. Really appreciate thank it. You. <laughs> I guess the most weird thing about talks online is the lack of being able to applaud. So well done. What an amazing talk. Thank you so much. And we do have questions coming in, which is great, and quite a few people typing. So please, everyone, do type your questions. And um, we'll start with a question. I apologize in advance for my um, reading of your name. I'm so sorry. but. Itumelang Moroyen, um, sorry, is asking, is saying, fascinating talk. I'm curious whether you explore the role of plant associated microbes in increasing photosynthesis capacity at elevated CO2 and temperature. That's a great question. I guess the very quick answer is for the purpose of this paper, we did not at all, but I think to I think that gets into some of the topics we discuss at the plant level of sort of resource allocation and nutrient movement throughout the plant. And so one of the things we talked about was the partitioning of sort of photosynthate to grain yield and to those things. But once we start um, considering the actual ecology of these, right, and think about the microbiome, then there's another level of partitioning that certainly, I think, many photosynthesis people, definitely me, um, often just don't consider at all. I think carbon into the leaf, then into the grain, job done. But we know that's not necessarily true. So thank you very much for highlighting it. So short answer, no. Um, and I think there's a real space for that. So yeah, definitely. I mean, we nod to some microbials or respiration stuff uh, in like some good reviews on that in the paper, but certainly um, there is definitely space for expanding on that. So it sounds like a good 
another good review topic. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, next up, we have Manu Maya Magar. Thank you for a nice and informative talk. I wanted to know which leaves are more responsive to temperature. Top leaves like the flag leaf or other bottom leaves and why? Also, what technique can be best used to measure the response in leaves and their glass house condition at small scale? That's an Amanda question. <laughs> Well, I think Caitlin might have some interesting insight on the differences within the canopy. Um, yes. But yeah, if you wanted to start there, maybe. No, you go. Go for it. Sorry. Well, I think one of the, the big things is that um, you have to consider that there is a temperature differential through your canopy. And so your top leaves, your flag leaves are going to be, um, you know, in the full sun, but they're also at uh, I guess they're not getting the benefit of the shade of the increased humidity of the temperature profiles throughout the canopy. And so that is something that I know we've discussed in the paper. So that's there for you in more detail. Um, but I would say if you're looking at measuring photosynthesis in controlled conditions of many lines, then your safest bet would probably be leaf level gas exchange. So um, you would wanna either get out a, a trusty old portable photosynthesis machine um, or talk to someone who does have skills in that, you'll note that we've left our emails up and both of us are pretty good connectors if you have questions about those types of things. But definitely in a glass house condition, I think screening many um, individuals, that would be the way to go. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, so next up, we have Doug or rip it off both enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, for this purpose, you are an early career researcher, Doug. Uh, so Caitlin, you mentioned changes to delay senescence. Wondering if you have thoughts about changing the rate that senescence occurs, faster, slower remobilization, et cetera, and effects of length of the growing season. Yeah, and so I guess, um keeping leaves along, li alive longer allows for greater photosynthesis. Um, I mean, in Australia, for example, we have our evergreen eucalypt trees that invest really heavily in resources to keep their leaves for longer so they don't just cycle them over every single year, um, which allows them to be really well adapted to photosynthesis in really sort of dry and harsh ecosystems. And so I think there is something that we can learn from the kind of native um, um, plants that are growing out in, um, in in these harsh, already really dry environments. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of the question, so I'm just scaling up to find it again. Um, da, 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 da. So, and then phenology, right, so phenology. So that's one thing that we're actually seeing. Um, quite a lot of work has come out of the Northern Hemisphere in particular in these deciduous systems, uh, looking at changes in phenology, phenology that are related to earlier um, increases in temperature earlier in the growing season. And so basically the growing season is getting warmer earlier, you're getting less of these sort of cold um, frost events that are occurring in sort of April and May in the Northern Hemisphere, so where you guys are. Uh, and so how is that then affecting planting dates, for example, that can be translated into how does that affect planting dates, but then does that also then translate into earlier senescence in, senescence in crops because they reach maturity faster? Um, there's elements of um, if they're planted earlier, do they then, you know, mature faster and then receive, you know, are they too um, well advanced or able to cope with really hot temperatures that might occur later in the growing season and later in summer? And so they sort of August and or late July, August sort of uh, temperatures. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of, I think a lot of these canopy modifications would help with, um, I guess, buffering plants and their phenology responses to temperature. Um, but certainly, yeah, um, we are seeing changes, at least in native ecosystems, and I'm sure there's changes in managed systems too. It's just that farmers can, I guess, um, manage their systems a little bit more within um, climate restrictions as opposed to native ecosystems that just have to deal with it. Okay, good. Um, so a few people are telling me whether they are ECRs or not, and I do apologize in advance if I ask your question and you're, you're or not an ECR. But, uh, so we'll go to Demi Sargent. Fantastic talk, thank you. Considering that rising temperatures or extreme heat events commonly co-occur with water deficit stress, 
how do we think we can overcome the trade-off between the physiological responses to these, uh, i.e. plants opening their stomata and their high temperatures thus increasing water loss? Where is the sweet spot? Do you think that mesophyll conductance is important here? That's a great question. Demi, you came in with the, the slicer. Um, yeah, I think the, the point that you were making um, definitely agrees with, with our philosophy on it that it is all related. And so you're right, improving stomata only might lead to growth in an environment where that's really detrimental. Um, more stomata might not be the answer, but maybe more stomata that are able to respond faster is the answer. And so I know Tracy Lawson's group has some really exciting work on speedy stomata, which might be really helpful there. Um, but I think your point was, do we think mesophyll conductance is important? Absolutely. Um, and so certainly for me, mesophyll conductance is one of those things that um, I, I know is important. I know it's there, but there are so many aspects of um, control points on mesophyll conductance that I personally find it hard to to wrap my head in it. And I'm I'm admitting this. Thank you for nodding, Elizabeth, because <laughs> you're never supposed to admit what you struggle to understand. Um, so yes, absolutely it is. So I think anything that can increase that diffusive path of CO2 from the atmosphere to the site of Rubisco is going to be critical. Um, and then again, just like different stomatal responses, differences in mesophyll conductance tend to be species specific and not necessarily responding the exact same way because we know that different species will have different components, right? So in some species, the cell wall is critical, but in some species, it seems to be entirely like liquid phase mesophyll conductance. Um, so is it important? Absolutely. But do I think we can give it one general statement of like, we should improve this? No, I think for mesophyll conductance, we're not entirely there yet, but very happy to hear your thoughts on that in the chat or by email or on Twitter or wherever. Very good. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'll have a question from Garab Zinta. Excellent talk, both of you. I have a question. What could be the key enzymes in photosynthesis that can be ideal targets for genetic engineering to impart heat, heat stress tolerance in C3 crops? Right. Um, well, Grav, I think I'm quite biased, uh, but I think if we look at um, photosynthesis, then the ideal targets for genetic engineering tend to be centered around Rubisco and its problems. And so we know that as temperature increases, Rubisco gets faster, it gets um, relatively sloppier, um, and it tends to have a chaperone protein that doesn't want to play ball with life at warmer temperatures. And so there are three targets at the enzyme level within that that seem to be, I mean, I will say seem to be amenable to genetic engineering. It's it's difficult, um, but they seem to be very clear cut answers that if we could solve that problem at the enzyme level, we could solve that problem of photosynthesis. And so that is where we spend most of our time on enzymes, certainly in this review. Um, and I think if you're looking for references on there, you could look at um, papers related to rubisco specificity or improving rubisco specificity, um, improving rubisco activase, or looking at some of the synthetic biology strategies to lower the cost of photorespiration. Um, and so any of those would be good, I think, Google Scholar targets to kind of see quickly what's going on in there. But if you want the fastest answer, you could click that DOI, um, what we've seen. people are spending a lot of time on right now to improve the thermal optimum of photosynthesis. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, I will now open for everyone. And uh, the, I, I want to go back up a little bit in the in the chat questions uh, so I don't miss uh, reading a few. So Jason Beringer, uh, great job in capturing the influence of temperature over a range of scales and great to have both your expertise looking at this issue. The question I have is what are the relative compens compensatory effects of increasing CO2 versus temperature? And that was a related question before. Are you looking at me, Caitlin? Well, do you want to talk about it at the, the enzyme scale? This is my boss asking this question, <laughs> by the way. So, <laughs> um, 
Yes, yeah, so we do see that growth at elevated CO2 tends to increase the thermal optimum of photosynthesis when you look at both of those um, stresses in combination. Uh, and so we can see that um, elevating CO2 tends to solve some of the some of the uh, enzyme level and leaf level problems because we have more CO2 available for Rubisco, so the oxygenation problem becomes less of an issue, and also issues with um, Rubisco activase become less of an issue in a high CO2 environment. However, plants are smarter than a pool of enzymes, and so they respond to growth at elevated CO2 by down-regulating Rubisco. So then you have less of the enzyme to do the job. Um, and so I think, again, it becomes uh, dependent on sort of the water, the temperature, and the CO2 effect coming in, and, and most of what we know, certainly, comes from work that's putting this in the field at soy base. So most of what we assume about C3 plants and the response of photosynthesis between carbon and water and temperature and crops comes from one specific crop. And so I think moving beyond that is a huge game changer um, to see how much of these are universal responses versus crop specific responses. Um, but that is, that is certainly the compensatory effect at the enzyme level. Maybe Caitlin, do you want to gloss? Yeah, I guess. Um, I guess when you scale that up to the canopy, and so like, that's where face studies really start to come into their own, because um, particularly at soy face, uh, yes, they have been testing um, the effects of elevated CO two mainly on soybean and corn, but they're starting to move into a bunch of different um, other um, crop varieties now, as well as there are other face studies um, at various parts uh, around the world. Uh, Lisa Ainsworth and Steve Long have just written a really good 30 year summary review uh, on face studies. So I highly recommend checking that out. But what they're seeing is that if you just have increased CO2 over at the plant canopy scale, you see an increase in productivity um, across most species, most crop varieties. But as soon as you add temperature into the mix and start to increase temperature alongside elevated CO2, you start to lose that CO2 fertilization effect because of the interaction of temperature. And so, um, yeah, Lisa and Steve's paper details that in a lot more um, complexity and goes into it a lot nicer than I've just said. But at the same time, yeah, um, certainly adding temperature does decrease that, that, comp that CO2 fertilization benefit. Hope that's answered your question, Jason. <laughs> Uh, can I just check with you both? How are you with time? So we have uh, a scheduled time until half past, but if you're happy to keep answering some questions, there's lots of interest, which is great to see. So can you just give me a thumbs up or down? When, okay, cool. Uh, so, and, and I do appreciate that some people will have other things and will have to go. And thanks so, so much for everybody to be here and to ask questions. And we'll, we'll keep asking questions and answering those questions for, for a bit longer. So, uh, Penny Tricker, thanks for the great talk. My question is, do we know what the limits of temperature increase and water deficits are on C2 and C4 photosynthesis? Great question, Penny. Um, so I I think um, I can answer it again from the sort of modeling photosynthesis leaf level space and then pass it over to Caitlin. Um, but certainly C4 photosynthesis has a higher thermal optimum. And so we get um, pushed towards higher photosynthesis or like higher temperatures before we see that, that peak in net photosynthesis drop offs. What we see at the growing regimes of C4 species. Um, I'm not sure if Marge Lundgren is on the call, um, but she would be the person to talk to about C2 photosynthesis because I think less is known about that one. A, because it's cryptic, but B, because um, it's not clear if that's always giving us the same temperature benefit as we see with the um, the full expression, I guess, of C4 with the the bundle sheath separation. Um, I think it's certainly a topic of growing concern, um, but I'm not necessarily sure if we see that benefit that we see from full C4 expression in C2. Um, but certainly C4s grow in warmer climates, um, and that's because, or in part because, their thermal optimum of photosynthesis and carbon gain in general is shifted higher. 
but it's also not a fail safe, I guess. And so the figure that I showed of the long term um, carbon fluxes that was measured over a maize field uh, during that hot and dry 2012 drought that hit the Midwest, um, it certainly stressed out the, the maize uh, to the point where yields were severely down, like yields uh, for some fields were as low as a soybean year and they normally doubled, if not triple, a soybean year yield. And so um, it's certainly, yeah, it certainly reaches like a, reaches a tipping point. And it's really important, I guess, to have these long-term studies to look at where are these tipping points likely to be and can we, I guess, better manage that in future. And so, for example, um, detecting heat stress in cropping systems earlier might help a land manager or a farmer to actually apply water earlier um, to get irrigation in place or to target specific areas of the field where um, the plants are starting to be stressed out. And this is sort of one element that we discuss in the paper that's an area of growth um, um, for ecosystem scale assessments. Thank you both. And in case you haven't seen Amanda, Marjorie approved that answer. Uh, <laughs> so, Nicholas uh, Dottrell, uh, I all great talk. Have you considered the effect of temperature on non-foliar photosynthesis? and how this might be relevant at different times of the growing season. So for example, green fruit during summer when temperatures may be increase, increasingly extreme with climate change. So we did not consider it as much in this review. However, I will link to a great review written by John Ferguson in Plant Cell and Environment that did get into um, some more of the non-foliar and particularly the, the timing of temperature, so on the effects on reproduction as well as photosynthesis and non-foliar photosynthesis. So if you bear with me one second, I'll add the link to the chat so you guys can find that one. Okay, so while you're doing that, Amanda, I'll, I'll read the next question from Wallace Cowling. Um, our observations in canola support your graph of increased stomatal conductance as temperature increases, as long as soil moisture is always at uh, field capacity. In addition, biomass increased as temperature increased. One might conclude that photosynthesis is not the major impact of heat stress if moisture is freely available. It is the process of meiosis, fertilization and embryo seed development that is mostly impacted by heat. Just a challenge for you to consider. <laughs> so any comments on that that you'd like yes, to make? Yes, thanks Wallace. <laughs> I also work with Wallace, so <laughs> we've had discussions about this. Um, and you're 100% right. I mean, as long as I think you've sort of touched on it here as well, as long as soil moisture is at field capacity, as long as the plants are well watered, um, then they can tick along and keep operating under heat stress fairly reasonably. It's kind of that adaptation, I guess, um, as Amanda touched on with, um, for example, with the stomatal adaptation, when plants are grown under heat stress, they're able to um, kick back up and be more um, um, operate at a higher optimum um, if grown under heat stress. But I think it gets back to uh, looking at, again, the maize, I'm to bring up that example again, when the corn was grown in really hot and dry, so below field capacity conditions, that's when the photosynthesis um, productivity really started to suffer. And so um, getting systems watered, um, and keeping them watered and at field capacity, I think is really important because then once provided that the plant has enough water, then you're absolutely right, Wallace, these um, processes of meiosis and fertilization and all of that sort of stuff then becomes um, secondary impact by heat stress. Um, and so I believe you guys wrote a very good uh, review on the genetic advancements that can be made to help deal with some of these um, challenges in the future. And so I recommend having a look at some of Wallace Cowling's work if you're looking at um, genetic progressions that we can make to um, help with heat stress. Brilliant. Um, Ashish Chaturvedi, um, thank you for the excellent presentation. Caitlin, do you think transpiration response is also maintaining the photosynthetic efficiency? Whether you could see such response as for stomatal conductance as both of them are closely related? Yeah, and so, I mean, the transpiration response is largely controlled by 
you know, the stomata and the plant's balance between needing to maintain photosynthesis, but also keeping a nice moist condition within the leaf. And so uh, I think it's all sort of part of this, it gets back to this sort of connected kind of system. I mean, what comes first in many ways? Is it the transpiration change? Is it the stomatal conductance change? Is it the need to photosynthesize uh, that's really driving these systems? And so, um, yeah, I think, it's also important to look at changes in transpiration response. Um, and again, I guess if the plant is losing too much water, the stomata then respond to that by closing. And so you start to lose your photosynthesis. And so uh, I'm not sure if that's really answered your question all that well, and feel free to jump in Amanda if you'd like to. Um, but yeah, I think it's all just sort of, you know, it's all very interlinked. And I don't think you can think of transpiration in isolation as stomatal conductance or photosynthetic. Um, efficiencies either. I think you've got it, Caitlin, and you can't separate photosynthesis from stromal behavior, right? So um, it's easy to do if you're mostly measuring photosynthesis in a controlled environment with an ERGA and 70% humidity or 60% humidity. That That's a an issue we don't have to think about. But as soon as a plant goes outside, those are incredibly dynamic responses. And for a plant, often the first line of defense, right? So the stomata will close in response to um, changes in the environment that are going to lead to water loss uh, and the problem that that, that um, presents, I guess, for a chloroplast certainly is that you're going to reduce the CO2 concentration within there um, if the stomata aren't open. And so all of these things are integrated. And one of our main goals with this was certainly to allow ourselves to break out of our boxes of thinking about everything in its place and start thinking about how these things are interacting with each other instead and what that might mean for some of our pet hypotheses, right? It's not necessarily easy or not necessarily beneficial to stay stuck in your own little space all the time. Exactly. Uh, we have a question from Nivedita Shaudari and um, uh, says, nice talk. Uh, I am wondering, rising temperature may cause tomato to be sluggish, which would cause more CO2 uptake, which would potentially be good for rubisco uh, to increase activity. Do you want to comment on that? Sure. Maybe, maybe I'll give a quick comment on that. I think one of the problems we find is that it's not necessarily a linear response. So we don't get the situation happening where as temperature goes up this many degrees, this percent of stomata will close or stay open or maybe be speedier. What we find instead are, are sort of that double belled response um, that we pointed out from uh, the Matthews and Lawson paper. Uh, and so what happens then is that you get situations where as it gets warmer, the stomata close so that you have even less CO2 entering into the chloroplast. And so you have a situation where as temperatures are increased, rubisco has a higher propensity to fix oxygen and the CO2 concentration starts dropping at the same time. And so it's actually making it at, at sort of that enzyme level even worse than it would normally be should the stomata just stay open. Um, if you pass that threshold, your stomata are, are remaining open, um, but then what you have is a situation where you're getting CO2 into the site of rubisco, which you're right, should boost rubisco activity, but the expense of that is increased water loss out into this um, likely drier and warmer atmosphere. And so it's the balance that gets thrown off there. Um, and those are the types of things that I think those really um, sophisticated canopy scale modeling people, I see Alex Wu is on the call, like those are the things that they're now able to start monitoring and modeling um, to, to try to build in these integrative responses. Um, Rakesh Tiwari, excellent presentation. Thanks so much. Could one of you provide some pointers on references to know more about leaf level hyperspectral imaging work happening at Illinois, please? So I guess, Caitlin, perhaps you could uh, post some, some of those references. Yeah, um, honestly, if you have a look at um, the plant scale section in um, our paper, then that has quite a number of uh, the citations. Catherine Me Meacham Hensold is the postdoc who's working most prominently on um, high throughput phenotyping um, imaging work at Illinois. Uh, and also um, Matt Sievers 
uh, in Carl Bonacki's group, who's also another postdoc who's doing some looking at some LIDAR and other hyperspectral uh, work as well. And they've just, um, so myself included, he and I and a few others, have also just written a uh, emerging topics uh, in life sciences paper for a special issue that was looking at different uh, ways in which to measure photosynthesis. And a lot of the hyperspectral work features in that as well. And so um, I can put that link at the very least in the um, comment box for you as well. Um, well, if you go on to the next topic. But yes, thank you for being interested in all the hyperspec work. And also, um, not just a shout out to Illinois, but Bob Furbank's team uh, at ANU and other um, colleagues um, across Australia in the translational photosynthesis team uh, and the and Australian plant phenomics um, or phenotyping team as well uh, at ANU are doing a lot of really good work in this space as well. And so it's not just the Illinois work, but also um, work from my fellow Aussies as well. Brilliant. So it's a plug in for them. <laughs> We have a question about uh, reactive oxygen species. Uh, Catherine Walsh says, uh, great talk, thank you. What effect do you think increasing ROS protective biochemistry within the leaf will have on grain yield as temperatures increase? Thanks. Yeah, great question, Catherine. Um, we didn't consider it necessarily for the purpose of this review, but I think from everything that I've read, I'm not a ROS person, um, but I know some ROS people. So from everything I've read and heard, um, it's going to have a, a benefit on certainly photosynthesis, cellular processes, and grain yield as temperatures increase. Um, and so if this is your your space and you have a, a good review or something that you can share in the chat, I would love to see it. Um, but my understanding is that the ROS accumulation will increase, um, certainly from the cell biology perspective, as temperatures increase. Um, and anything that would help quench that uh, is certainly going to be a benefit. And that's one of the, the theoretical benefits of photorespiration, right? So um, is that it allows us to deal with ROS accumulation um, via those detoxification reactions from the proxosome. But again, it's it's certainly not my research space. Um, so I, a, bit of a bit of a poor answer, I'm sorry. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> Um, Sabarna Sharma, thanks for the great talk. Which which leaf shoot traits are associated with useful root traits for heat and or drought tolerance? Yeah, um, and so particularly in the leaf, because I'm not as familiar with the shoots, but um, for heat tolerance, it's Waxy coating we've been finding uh, in well, some studies have been finding that the waxier the leaf surface is, uh, the more able, it, the more I guess hydrophobic it is to losing its water. It also a waxy leaf surface can reflect light a little bit better, so it changes the albedo of the, um, the canopy. And so um, combining leaf waxiness along with uh, changes in stomatal density and size, particularly when you're going from the top of the canopy through the canopy. And so if you're at the top of the canopy, you want the ideal plant you want, they've got a lot of CO2 um, available to them at the top of the canopy because that's where the most atmospheric mixing is occurring. Uh, and they've also got a high amount of sunlight. So you want a leaf that can reflect excess sunlight but still take in a fair amount of CO2. And towards the bottom of the canopy, where you've got a much more humid environment, you can have a lot more stomata because um, the, you're going to have less of a, a gradient or a pull for water to exit the leaf. And then you'll have more stomata to allow more CO2 to enter the leaf at the lower canopy levels. And so um, modifications, it's thought the modifications to um, plant canopies in that respect in terms of leaf traits, so waxiness and also stomatal size and density are probably the, the, the two that I know of most, but that's not to say that's an exhaustive list and that there's many others out there as well um, that can help with, yeah, uh, maximizing heat and drought tolerance in crop systems. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, I guess there's a, I suppose, final comment in the chat from Alex Wu uh, saying, I totally agree with Amanda. Uh, integrated assessment would provide how the dynamic interacting components across scales add up to determine crop growth. And if I may just take one more minute of your time, I had a question about that I think hasn't come up yet in terms of um, increasing temperatures during 
day versus during the night and when it increases both during the day and the night or when it might increase more during the night and it seems like there's some recent data coming up that increases of temperature during the night might actually affect what happens during the day and if it senses so i wonder if you could comment on that <laughs> thank you yeah, I mean, I'll comment from maybe the experimental point of view that I think it's something we haven't been designing our experiments well to deal with. So when we have a temperature increase, you know, we put a five degree increase in the chamber or in the infield heaters, and we say there we've raised the temperature by five degrees, but that's not necessarily how things are going to change. And so I think starting to build, since this is a talk sponsored by the Journal of Experimental Botany, um, starting to maybe mimic some of our experimental systems to better reflect what what the changes are that we're looking at. So are we mimicking um, a heat wave? Are we mimicking um, spikes in nighttime temperatures during a heat wave? Are we mimicking really hot afternoons? Is that what we're, we're getting um, is critical. But yeah, Elizabeth, I agree um, entirely that I just think it's something, there's a lot of evidence now suggesting we have to start thinking about this and we have to start um accounting for it because i think a lot of some of the temperature effects certainly on um cellular level processes we've been attributing to just a a brute force change in temperature when really we know you know nighttime temperatures are incredibly detrimental to wheat yield so um that's probably having a a greater impact than the afternoon temperatures that a plant might be able to deal with. I don't, yeah. And I mean, I guess our review focused on the effects of crop photosynthesis and temperature, but I mean, at night you don't have photosynthesis, but there's still a lot of, you know, translocation of sugars going on in the plant uh, and reproductive changes or developmental changes that are occurring at night. Um, also with rising temperatures at night also promotes soil microbial activity and so we don't really, I mean we kind of give a nod to the importance of soil microbial activity particularly at the ecosystem scale but how those processes and the, the turning over of carbon and carbon cycling in these systems is likely to change particularly with higher nighttime temperatures I think is a, an area of growth that we need to sort of look into a lot more. Thank you both. Uh, we do have one more question from Manu. Um, what can be the minimum duration of heat stress for a plant to respond at enzyme or protein level? And what stage of the plant development, early or later growth stage? Um, yeah, so again, great question. I think that you get different responses with the different intensity and duration of the heat stress. And so, um, you know, 20 minutes of heat stress might impact a different, a very different response than full growth at heat stress, than a heat shock treatment of two hours, than um, a transition from everything was grown at a common temperature and then we split them. And so I think there's been a really great, another really great review on temperature um, from plant cell and environment. Uh, I'll try to link to it really quickly in the chat again, that gets through um, disentangling some of the language that we've been using. What is a heat shock? What is a heat stress? What is a thermal acclimation? Um, but I think, yeah, I think you're you're going to see that effect, certainly at the enzyme level, because temperature is completely linked to enzyme function. There's, there's no getting around that. It's not just Rubisco. Enzymes work faster at faster temperatures. That's that's the Arrhenius equation, right? That's the biophysics of it. Um, but as for the second part of your question, what stage of the plant? Again, I think it depends on the question you're looking at and it depends on the intensity of your heat stress. So if you put a seedling, if you put an Arabidopsis seedling at 30 degrees Celsius, it's not going to be very But if you put a seedling at 30 degrees Celsius, that's very close to its thermal optimum. So Different species are primed for different temperatures. Um, and as plants grow, so as you move from that very early stage growth into um, a stronger, healthier plant, it can withstand a bit more stress. I think that's that's my comment on that. And I'll just, um, Manu, I'll just drop this. Um, this is the link to the special issue um, in the chat right now. 
thanks Amanda and thanks Caitlin. So I, I think with that we'll we'll come to the end of the Q and A. And uh, thank you both so much for such an interesting talk and such an interesting Q and A discussion. Uh, clearly, it's generated a lot of interest and uh, and it's proved a really really nice session. So thank you so much. Um, we did have a note. Yeah. So um, we've been asked to to please fill out the post-session survey and also um, uh, heads up to the SEB virtual conference happening later in uh, June, beginning of July. Um, yeah, so exactly. There's lots of uh, uh, posts now coming up with more information on those. So there will be lots of interesting talks and um, yeah, follow those links for more information. So. Thanks so much, Amanda and Caitlin. This has been a really exciting and really a good session. Thank you. <laughs> thanks very Thank much. You. Yeah, thanks for all the questions and thanks very much, Elizabeth, for moderating. It was really fun. <laughs> Thank you. See you later, guys. <laughs> Bye-bye.